It's often claimed uh, that the Jews of America are to the left of most Israelis and certainly of the Israeli government uh, on issues concerning the peace process. Um, what differentiates the right and the left, of course, is not their desire for peace. I guess a separate study could be done on how it is that the left captured the term peace. Um, everybody wants it. But what the right and the left seem to differ on, if one could summarize it very quickly, is their opinion about what approach is more likely, in fact, to bring peace. Uh, from the perspective of the left, peace is more likely if Israel concedes more of what the Palestinians seek. From the perspective of the right, an effective, durable peace is not in the cards under the current circumstances, and therefore, a peaceful situation is more likely to occur if Israel shows more determination and yields less of what it is asked to yield. The question of whether American Jews should express any opinion on the subject is again the issue of still another paper. But it leaves us to the question of exactly where do American Jews stand. American Jews are of course divided, but what's the balance? What are the percentages? What are the proportions? Many, many polls have been taken. Many are reported. Almost every few days, you and I both read about them. Uh, the first thing we can observe, of course, is that they tend to confirm the predispositions of the sponsoring organizations. I mean, just one recent headline that was marvelous from the Post. ADL poll shows higher support for Israel than its survey by Dovish J Street. That's not news. Um, but, you know, it, 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 one of many such examples. How does it happen that just because a different organization sponsors it, the results are so different? Are they sampling different people? Um, what's happening? Before reporting on my own data, I thought it would be interesting to look at the way some of the other data developed. And I have to tell you, I discovered a textbook case of how to bias your results. I teach research methodology. I teach students how to do questionnaires. And I think I'm going to use the few examples that I'm about to give you literally as classroom examples of how you can guarantee the results you want before I come to some, I think, much better data that we should look at more carefully. And by the way, the errors are made both on the right and on the left. A J Street survey reported that 58% of American Jews support the idea that the United States should play an active role in resolving the Arab-Israel conflict, even if it means the United States publicly states its disagreement with Israel. Of course, the question, would you support or oppose the United States playing an active role in helping the parties to resolve the Arab-Israel conflict, even if it meant the United States publicly stating its disagreements with Israel, immediately follows the same question which ends stating its disagreements with both the Israelis and the Arabs. Now, once you've agreed that the United States should be willing to express its disagreements with both, how can you then say no to the one about Israel? One more example. The survey reports that 57% of American Jews believe that the United States should pr exert pressure on Israel to make compromises necessary to achieve peace. 57%. Of course, that immediately follows a question of whether the United States should pressure both Israelis and Arabs to do that. In other words, the people responding to the questionnaire were put in a position in which they could hardly say no. One more example from the left. The report of the Arab American Institute and Americans for Peace Now, done jointly, reports that 87% of American Jews support a negotiated two-state solution. That's overwhelming. Would you like to hear the question that was asked? Would you strongly support, somewhat support, somewhat oppose, or strongly oppose a negotiated peace agreement between Israelis and Palestinians that included the establishment of an independent, secure Palestinian state, along an independent, secure Israeli state, and resolved final status issues of Jerusalem refugees and borders. In other words, if they agreed to everything, would you go along? Not surprising that 87% said yes. Or again, one more example from this study, which reported 
that 70% of American Jews support the Arab League Peace Initiative. 70% support the Arab League Peace Initiative. Would you like to hear the question? The Arab League recently reaffirmed its commitment to the 2002 Arab League Peace Initiative. This initiative offers Israel full diplomatic relations with all Arab countries in exchange for an agreed-on comprehensive solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Do you strongly support, somewhat support, strongly oppose, or strongly oppose this initiative as a basis for negotiations? So 70% agree. Now let's look at the way the right does the same thing. Um, Lunds Global Studies reported that 77% of American Jews believe the Palestinian incitement and a culture of hatred is the real cause of the conflict. Here's the question. Incitement is the name given by some to the practice of Palestinian media, mosques, schools, and civic activity that promote extreme anti-Israel and anti-Jewish activity, such as honoring suicide bombers as heroes for young people to emulate. Others have used the phrase culture of hatred. Which do you think is a greater obstacle to peace? If their names some. Or, from the same study, The question, the Palestinian Authority, which governs the West Bank under the Fatah Party, and Hamas, which governs the Gaza Strip, have announced plans to formally reconcile and join together as one Palestinian government. Hamas is recognized as a terrorist organization, not just by Israel, but also by the European Union and the United States. Their official charter calls for them to, quote, fight and kill the Jews, close quote. If Hamas is a major part of the Palestinian government, should Israel refuse to negotiate, etc., etc., begin negotiations anyhow. And one last example from the right. I want to be balanced, two from each. There's a recent national survey reported by Secure America Now that asked, do you approve or disapprove of the United Nations voting to declare a Palestinian state that refuses to renounce terrorists and is linked to terrorist organizations? Another question that they asked was, should Israel be forced to return to its pre-1967 borders, which were susceptible to attack at points where the country was only eight miles wide? Okay. In other words, the reports that we read, usually headlining the conclusions that the organizations wish to give us, really depend very often on the questions. That being the case, are there any really good data that we can depend on? Most good studies of American Jews, when they deal with Israel at all, deal with other aspects of Israel. How close do you feel to Israel? How important is Israel in your Jewish identity? And so on. The only study that is done regularly that asks American Jews their opinions on peace process type issues is the annual survey done by the American Jewish Committee under the title Annual Survey of American Jewish Opinion. And there are three or four questions that have appeared in that study every year for the last 10 years, twice in 2010. I'll submit to you, and you'll see it on, on the handout that I prepared, with, in which I indicate the exact wording of the questions. The questions seem to me, at least, to be fairly worded, appropriately worded, not leading people to respond one way or another. Those questions are repeated every year, and they, they deal with the crucial issues two-state solution, Jerusalem, settlements, and the fundamental goal of the Arabs in, in the conflict. Now, there is a problem with a sample. The, the American Jewish Committee uses Cinevet, which is a, research, a um, market research firm, to gather the data. Uh, and Cinevet has a panel which it refurbishes. Um, and which it, from which it seeks opinions on a regular basis. So the American Jewish Committee, in effect, buys into one of their regular surveys rather than drawing their own sample. That is not the ideal technique in social scientific research. However, it's better than other studies, first, in that it does ask those questions on a regular basis, and secondly, there is no reason to believe that that panel of respondents is biased in this regard. 
When you test that panel for other variables against other studies like the National uh, Jewish Population Study in 2000, we find it highly similar on such measures as religious movements, Orthodox Reform Conservative, political identification, liberal conservative, political party that they prefer, and their expression of how close they feel to Israel. On those questions, the Sinovate sample is very close to the NJPS sample, which lends credence to the to legitimacy of that sample. Also, whatever biases may go into a willingness to be part of a market research panel seem to be irrelevant to the issues before us. So there's really no reason to suspect bias uh, of any sort. With that in mind, let's see what we found. If you look at table number one, which summarizes the major outlines of the, um, of the findings over the last decade, and the, the questions as you see on the table are exactly the way they were worded in the questionnaire, with no contextual issues before or after. They came one right after the other. In the current situation, do you favor or oppose establishment of a Palestinian state? In other words, the two-state solution, we see that American Jewry is in effect evenly divided. The notion that American Jews are overwhelmingly in favor of the two-state solution simply does not hold. On the question of whether Israel should be willing to compromise on the status, oh, by the way, I have to call to your attention, you notice that the uh, data for 2009 do not add up to 100 or 101 or 99. Um, I could not track down the error. This is the report, the, these are the reported figures by the American Jewish Committee, both in the version deposited in the data bank and on the American Jewish Committee's own website. Either it was never called to their attention or they never bothered to correct it. Clearly there was a mistake. My hunch is, my hunch is that the 41 should be 51. Then it would add up. But I can't be certain. Um, on the second question, should Israel be willing to compromise on the status of Jerusalem? And again, it's specified in the framework of a permanent peace with the Palestinians. Again, it, it's not half and half. A clear majority of American Jews would oppose such a compromise, even in the framework of a peace agreement. And again, the figures are remarkably consistent, a few percentage points up or down. With regard to the, the settlements, you know, it is often reported American Jews are against the settlements. Well, should Israel be willing to dismantle all, some, or none as part of a permanent peace settlement with the Palestinians? Now, again, it's as part of a permanent peace settlement, not before it, not as a condition for negotiations, but as part of the settlement itself. The most frequent answer, of course, is some. That's also the easiest answer because it's the broadest answer. You know, does some mean almost all or almost none? What's more significant is if you compare the nuns with the alls, many more American Jews say that no settlements should be dismantled than say all settlements should be dismantled. And again, the support for settlement seems to have, or for the existence of settlement seems to have grown over the years. By a small amount, but seems to have grown over the years. Finally, do you disagree or disagree with the statement, the goal of the Arabs is not the return of occupied territories, but rather the destruction of Israel? American Jews overwhelmingly agree. Overwhelmingly agree. And again, the figures are consistent and stable over a 10-year period. Finally, do you think that there will or will not come a time when Israel and its Arab neighbors will be able to settle their differences? Again, that question was asked only in 2006 and 2007, um, and you see that there's more pessimism than optimism over whether or not um, there will be a, a kind of solution. The marginals are clear. But marginals are limited to poll taking. You can't do analysis with them. Because, you know, what kinds of Jews are more likely to give this answer? What kinds of Jews are more likely to give that answer? And I wanted to do that kind of analysis. The latest year for which I could do it was 2005, simply because the data after that are not made available. I don't know quite how to comment. The data are supposed to be deposited, in theory, with a national with the North American Jewish Data Bank. The Data Bank reports that they never received them. The American Jewish Committee initially suggested to me that Sinovate was supposed to deposit them, but somehow they never managed to get Sinovate to deposit them, uh, even though the committee claims that they own them. 
Um, and I have to tell you that when I was asked for the 2010 data, I was turned down. Um, I was told that I could not have access to them. Um, therefore, the latest year for which um, I will not report the rest of the conversation. I, I, the latest year for which I could get my hands on the raw data, because they are publicly available, is 2005. In order to see whether 2005 may be atypical, I also did 2001. Now, are data this old still valuable? I would suggest to you that they are. That relationships, that is, the relationships among variables are much more likely, much less likely to change than the marginals themselves. The population may prefer this or not like that, more or less, but a relationship, these kinds of Jews are this way and those kinds of Jews are that way, that is much more likely to remain stable. Not only is it more likely to remain stable, but all other studies of American Jews have suggested that the patterns that emerged in 2005 are likely still to be in place. And those patterns are significant. Um, what I did was develop a, a sort of left to right scale. What I did was take the questions on the survey, um, weighting each question separately, and saw what each individual responded. The most liberal answer to all questions resulted in a scale value of zero. The most, the, the most right uh, answer, not left, right side answer of, an all, of all questions resulted in the score of 100. I then divided them into left, right, and center on the basis uh, of the following basis. If they got scores between 0 and 33, they were on the left. If they got scores between 67 and 100, they were on the right. And if they got scores between 33 and 67, they were center. In other words, the left, right, and center are not relative. They are absolute descriptions of the positions of the people. With that in mind, let's look at some of what we found. In table two, you see that clearly American Jewry is more on the right than on the left, with most, of course, in the center. Between 2001 and 2005, the right has remained stable, 40 to 39, but the left lost about a third of its numbers to the center. The left declined by about a third, and the center picked those up. So the right remained stable, but the left lost to the center between 2001 and 2005. With regard to gender, there were no differences. There are no tables because men and women turned out to be virtually the same, within a, a percentage point or two on all measures. But age showed a very interesting pattern. It's often claimed that young Jews are becoming alienated from Israel because young Jews are to the left, and Israel now takes positions to the right. At least based on these data, that has to be explored further. Because if you look at the under 30 group in 2005, as well as in 2001, they are more to the right than any other age group. They are more to the right. If you look across the top column, a smaller percentage is in the left, and they have a much higher left-right score. The youngest group is the farthest to the right in both years, more so in 2005 than in 2001. Now, how might one explain that? There are a couple of options that have been suggested. One is that the youngest group has the highest proportion of orthodox in it which may well be, and in fact, is the case. I don't have the table here, but let me give you some of the numbers. In the under 30 age group, 21% of them claim to be part of orthodoxy. The 30s, 16%, and then 40s, 50s, and 60s falls down to the usual 6 or 7%, with a 70 and above 11%. In other words, from 40 on, it's what you would expect. But young Jews in their 30s, 16% were Orthodox, and of those under 30, 21% claimed to be part of Orthodoxy. Now, is that, when you said the survey that was taken yeah. represented American Jewry as by the National Jewish Population Service as a whole? Those figures also? Yes. Well, in a way, yes, they do. Um, the NJPS data, interestingly, show that if you consider all American Jews, 
about the usual 8 to 10 percent claim to be orthodox. But if you narrow the sample to young American Jews, I think the cutoff age for that was 35 or 40, who are synagogue members, member of any synagogue, no matter what they do with it, they're members, the percentage goes up to 30 to 35 percent. In other words, there are many people who suggest that, you know, that, that this becomes a sign of the future. So one of the reasons that is suggested for these findings is that the youngest group includes a higher proportion of Orthodox, and Orthodox tend to be more conservative. There's a problem with that explanation, however. The problem is that one of the other questions that was asked in the, by the American Jewish Committee was, do you consider yourself extremely liberal? So, um, liberal, somewhat slightly liberal, moderate, slightly conservative, conservative, or extremely conservative. Oh, we'll come to the, the, the later, but let me talk about the under 30s. Those under 30, 16% considered themselves extremely liberal, compared to between 6 and 8% of every other age group. And 55% considered themselves liberal, either extremely somewhat or just liberal, compared to between 39 and 49% of every other age group. In other words, they may be more orthodox, but they're also more liberal. So one cannot explain their being on the right on peace process issues simply by their being orthodox and the orthodox are conservative. The fact that they're orthodox may have something to do with it, but that does not make them politically conservatives. They remain, to be, they remain political liberals. Even more of them are extreme political liberals by their own definition than is the case um, for other groups. But while they're liberal, they may be conservative on peace on process peace, That's issues. precisely the point. They, they see themselves as extremely liberal by political identity, but they remain conservative on, or to the right, on peace process issues. Exactly the point. Now, if you look at Table 4 and take that variable altogether and how people define themselves, identify themselves, Again, the, the order, I mean, it's what you would expect. The more conservative they are, the more to the right they are on peace process issues in both years. But what I find to be the most significant number on Table 4 is that 45. What that means is that American Jews who identify themselves as extremely liberal, given the option that they had liberal or slightly liberal, I mean, they understand themselves as all the way over to the left on most issues, still get an average score with regard to peace process issues of 45, which means they are in the center, slightly left of center, but basically dead center, even though they see themselves as extremely liberal on everything else. Oh, so these numbers yeah. in Table 4 are numbers relating to peace process issues. Correct. And then the categories are... Or a general political identification. How do you see yourself? And the how do you see yourself, that came well, later in the questionnaire. Is, 100 is hard right, peace well, process, uh, yeah, yes. and, and zero, zero is hard is left. Hard left. Right. Zero means they answered every one of those questions on the left, as far on the left as you can get, and 100 means they answered every one as far on the right as you could get. Which means on the, those Jews who call themselves extremely liberal, generally politically, are still dead center on peace process issues. They're not on the left. Now, one other issue I think remains. There obviously is a, a controversy that plays itself out always when the left and the right get together to talk about what Israel ought to do. The right usually takes the position that the more strongly Jewish and the more committed to Israel someone is, the more likely is to be on the right. And the left takes the position that the left is just as Jewish and just as committed to Israel as is the right. Well, we can look at some of those data. There were three questions in the questionnaires in 2005 and 2001 on Israeli commitment and one on Jewishness. The issues, that, the questions that touched on Israel commitment are how close do you feel to Israel? They had to agree or disagree with the statement, caring about Israel is a very important part of my being a Jew. And they were asked whether they had been to Israel. The question on overall Jewishness, there was only one. And that is how important would you say being Jewish is in your own life? And again, the data are in Table 5. We see a clear pattern again. On all of the Israel questions, the closer they are to Israel, the more they are to the right. And the more important they say their Jewishness is, 
the more they are to the right. Now, going beyond that, if one looks further, I combine the three Israel questions into an overall Israel scale, which I then divided again into three, strong, medium, and weak attachment to Israel. And if you look at table six, it becomes even clearer. Of those with strong attachment to Israel, in 2005, only 6% were on the left compared to 52 on the right. And if you look at those with weak attachment to Israel, still, although left and right, are, I mean, more are on the left, it's almost tied. I mean, a 3% difference becomes negligible. They're virtually tied. Clearly, the stronger the attachment to Israel, the more likely they are to be on the right. And the average scores at the bottom of that table also make that absolutely clear. Um, I wanted to study, by the way, the people who, are, who have strong attachment to Israel but are on the left to see what they're like, since there clearly aren't as many of them as, as is often advertised. I could not do that study. There were only 22 such people in the sample. Now, if, if, that is, if one can extrapolate from that, that means that about 2.2% of the American Jewish population is strongly attached to Israel and on the left. That's it. Now, perhaps the figures are wrong. Maybe it's 3% or 4%. But no more than that have both strong attachment to Israel and are on the left. Now, I know it doesn't sound that way when we listen to the radio, we watch television, we read the newspapers. That may be the point. Look, for example, the reform movement. The leadership of the reform movement usually makes public statements on the left on these issues. We know that. Look at table number seven, which is, is by movement. If you look at the reform movement in 2005, 20% are on the left, 31% are on the right. Now, it is true that the reform movement, people are more likely to be on the left than the other movements. 20 is compared to 11 or 3, the just Jewish 20, in both 2001 and 2005. The reform movement is more left than the other movements, but it is still more right than it is left, despite what its leaders have to say. And that, of course, brings me Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. On the reform movement, I also, on specific issues. Hold it. One moment. Here we go. Whether they agree with should Israel be willing to compromise on Jerusalem as a unified Jewish city? In the reform movement, 43% say yes, but 50% say no. On the question of settlement, settlements, in the reform movement only, again, 47% say some settlements should be removed, but 19% say all should be removed. That's more than the other movements. But 31% say no settlements should be removed, and that's in the reform movement. In other words, there would seem to be a gap between what are often the public statements of the leaders and the views of the people. But that isn't news. Let me read you a quote from one of Danny Elazar's studies in the late 90s. The majority of the American Jewish leadership has been in favor of territorial compromise all along by about two to one. However, the Jewish public in the United States has not been even if they now have moved more in that direction. So there was a real gap between the American Jewish leadership and the average American Jew. Danny said it then, it is still true now, and it is something that, uh, this was in the late 90s. Um, it was true then, it is still true now, and it is something that we should be aware of, and to refer to one or two of the things Dory said in his introduction, we hope the political leadership in the United States will also be aware of, as they understand that everybody who goes to the polls casts the same one vote. Thank you. <laughs>